not gotten her to do that. So you can still enough to get her. Thank you very much. Chapter 1, 1 Peter, we talked about the position that those people occupied. That is, they are among the saved, they are among the elect, they are children of God. Peter, of course, is trying to encourage them under some very difficult circumstances to remain faithful to God, not give up, <clears throat> just because they are going through some very difficult circumstances. And they needed that encouragement. And as a result of discouragements and troubles and trials that we face in our life as a child of God, we need the same encouragement. That's why these uh, letters are so valuable to us, because the position that they occupy or occupied is the same position that we occupy having obeyed the gospel of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. So we can receive the same encouragement from the letter that Peter wrote to them in that regard as they receive from it. And so then when we come into chapter 2, we're going to talk about <clears throat> the people they are. We talked about the position they occupy, and we're going to talk about the people that they are. And we'll break that down in several different aspects as we go through this chapter. So here's people who are in a right relationship with God. They're His children. They have been born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible, by the Word of God, as so stated back in um, chapter 1. They are Christians. Galatians chapter 3. For you are all the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus, for... As many of you, as were baptized into Christ, did put on Christ. That's where they are. They don't want to lose that. They don't want to lose the benefits of that. Then when we come to chapter 2, one of the basic things that we'll notice is the separation that these people have relative to the world. <clears throat> You'll recall in 2 Corinthians chapter 2, 6, beginning in verse, um, well, beginning actually in verse 14, Paul raises a series of questions. What communion hath light with darkness? What fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness? And he lists asks several different questions in that regard, to which the answer is obvious in each case. There is no fellowship between, there is no communion between, so he says, Wherefore, come out from among them, and be ye separate, saith the Lord. Touch not the unclean thing, I will receive you. Be a father to you, and be my sons and daughters. And so that's the people they are. Now that they understand the position they occupy, the relationship they have with God. Now let's see what kind of people you are in that regard. So God cares for His children. But at the same time, he expects us to grow, doesn't he? In Second Peter chapter 3, down about verse 18, he encourages them to grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. In this chapter then, he begins by saying, Wherefore, lay us laying aside all malice and all guile and hypocrisies, and envies and all evil speakings. As newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the word, that ye may grow thereby. If so be ye have tasted that the Lord is gracious, to whom coming as unto a living stone, disallowed indeed of men, but chosen of God and precious, ye also as lively stones, are built up a spiritual house and holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. Wherefore also, 
It is contained in the Scriptures. Behold, I lay in Zion a chief cornerstone, elect, precious. He that believeth on him shall not be confounded. Unto you, therefore, which believe, he is precious. But unto them which are disobedient, the stone which the builders disallowed, the same is made the head of the corner, and a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. Even to them which stumble at the word, being disobedient, whereunto also they were appointed. So these first eight verses, that's where we begin our division of this particular chapter by suggesting that these people, the people they are, they are a spiritual people. That's what he wants them to understand. They're not of the world anymore. They've been brought out of the world. They separated themselves from the world. So they are striving now for spiritual progress. Spiritual progress. You've got to move on. That's what he wants them to see. Not only then does he say in chapter 1, don't turn aside from the position that you occupy. Don't, don't turn loose of that. But in addition, you need to, to keep growing. You need to keep strengthening yourselves in the Lord. And of course, the stronger they become spiritually, the, the easier, that's a pretty loose term under the circumstances, but it would be easier then for them to overcome the extreme difficulties, persecutions that they were currently facing. And so it's never going to be easy to live the Christian life. Our Lord never promised that it would be easy. As a matter of fact, in 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 12, He says, Yea, and all that live godly in Christ Jesus shall do what? Suffer, Suffer persecution. So He never promised that it would be easy. 1 Peter chapter 4, when we get over there, He's going to deal with the same concept when He says, Let none of you suffer as a murderer, or as a thief, or as an evildoer, or as a busybody in other men's matters. Yet, if any man suffer as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God in this behalf. And so it's not easy to live that Christian life. And, and so to, to move on, to grow, to make progress in this Christian life, there's some things that are involved. And so he begins when he uses that word, wherefore, in consequence of the fact that you have been regenerated to a new life by the Word of God. That's chapter 1. There's some things that you've got to do. So he's, and we know this, but as I think sometimes we lose sight of it, where do these little chapter headings come from? Men. 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 Peter didn't make a break in his thought right here. He's said to them that you've been born again by incorruptible seed, by the Word of God, that, that's going to endure forever. Wherefore, because of the position that you occupy, here are some things that you need to think about in order to continue to grow. Wherefore lay aside, laying aside all malice and all guile and hypocrisies and envies and all evil speakings. Lay aside. Put aside. That's the idea involved here. So anything, in essence, he, he lists some things specifically here. But you could, you could literally say anything any act or any disposition that's going to destroy what you have, the position that you occupy, put it away. Get rid of it. And we've noticed Colossians chapter 3 in that context before, in which Paul says, If ye then be risen with Christ, seek those things above, where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. Set your affection on things above, not on things on the earth. Then when you come down to verse 5, Colossians chapter 3, he says, Mortify therefore your members 
What does that word mean? Put to death. Put away from you. Well, that is exactly what Peter is saying to these people. You've been born again. You are now children of God. You see the position that you occupy. As a result of that, there's some things that you must put away in order to continue to grow. So you might think of verse 1 as, as hindrances to growth. That's what they are. They will not allow the child of God to grow as he ought to grow in this new life. So put these things away from you. And that little phrase, lay aside, is a decisive act. It's not something that you can take lightly, not something you can do casually. Here is a serious charge. Put these things away from you. They must be done with permanent result. That's the nature of the language in the original here relative to this, this particular phrase, lay aside. It is, it is an act that has continuing results. So when we put away malice today, we can pick it back up tomorrow, right? Wrong. Put it away from you. Keep it away from you. Don't let it get back in your life. So that's, that's the significance of this little phrase, lay aside. Then he talks about these things in particular. First thing he talks about is, is malice. What is malice? What, what word would we probably use instead of malice? Huh? Well, we'd probably use, at least I would use the word hatred. Uh, it's a disposition of man that really has a desire to hurt somebody else. Deliberate intention of hurting someone else. Have you ever hurt anybody else? If you've lived very long, you have. Now, whether or not you did it deliberately is a different matter. We hurt people all the time without a deliberate effort on our part. Sometimes we're even unconscious of it, unaware of it, but it happens. But this idea involved here is a deliberate effort to hurt somebody, that, that disposition that basically says, if I ever get a chance... I will get even. What does Peter say about that attitude? Put it away. Get rid of it. It's not going to do you any good as a child of God. It's going to hinder you from growing and developing as you ought to. Now, the American Standard has the word wickedness here. And that's, uh, Martin mentioned that a minute ago. Um, but we've got to get rid of that that attitude that wants to hurt anybody. Put away malice. How much malice? Hold on just a little, can't you? No. Got to put it all away. No room for it in the heart of the child of God. And all guile. The word guile here is craftiness. Literally to catch with bait. What picture do you get in that regard of, of how we relate to one another? I guess we would call it setting somebody up, wouldn't we? Set them up. We don't, wanna, we don't want it to look like we've deliberately done something malicious against them, so we'll just kind of set them up and let them take the fall on their own. That's the idea involved. That's not the attitude that the child of God has relative to others. Then he talks about hypocrisies. What does that word mean? Who is a hypocrite? All right, literally it, it means play acting. Play acting. Pretending to be something that you're not. Pretense, that's the idea with the intent to deceive, whether it be an attitude or whether it be an action. 
Can you be a hypocrite in just your, your attitude? You've got a rotten, stinking attitude, but you put on a face like you've just the sweetest, lovingest person in the world. I was talking with one of my tennis students the other day, and, and something came up about a friend of theirs. And I said, well, you know, that, that, that individual seems like just one of the sweetest, nicest people. That, that's what I see. And this student said, you don't see the real person. Well, I knew, I knew what they meant by that. There was another side. When they, when they got away from perhaps adult supervision or whatever, they became a different kind of person. Pretense. Acting. Pretending to be something that you're not. Put that away. Who are we? What are we? We're children of God. What are we supposed to act like? Children of God. Children of God. This was a problem that Jesus had constantly during His earthly ministry, wasn't it? Everywhere He went, who did He face? Hypocrites. Scribes, Pharisees, hypocrites. Pretending to be the most religious people of the day, but they weren't. We have people like that in the church today. You see them at church services. You see them at social gatherings. What do they seem to be? Most religious, pious, humble, caring people in the world. But then when you find out about them under different circumstances, you find out that they are the devil in disguise. Peter says, put that away. That's not the life of a child of God. That's, that's not going to help you grow spiritually. Get that away from you. Envies. What is envy? Wanting what somebody else has, perhaps a, a, a feeling of bitterness because of what somebody else has. It, it's hard to distinguish at times certain words. Covetous, envy, jealous. Those words are so closely tied together in this position. But he says we've got to get that away. How should we respond when somebody else is blessed? How did Paul say in Romans chapter 12 to respond? Rejoice with those that do rejoice and weep with those that weep. And so there's the disposition that the child of God is to have. So put that away. Matter of fact, in Proverbs chapter 14 and verse 30, the, the proverb writer said that, that envy is the rottenness of the bone. The rottenness of the bone. So somebody may appear to be very spiritual on the outside, but on the inside they're rotten. You know, we, we sometimes speak in those terms physically. You, you know of somebody that, as far as you know, they are a picture of health. Just a picture of health. Then they, they go to the doctor. What do they find out? On the inside, they may be eaten up with cancer or something. Appear to be very healthy. Well, spiritually, that's what he's saying here. Don't pretend to be something that you're not. Get rid of these dispositions that, that just rotten you from the inside out. Get that away from you. Evil speakings. What's the idea there? Slander. Gossip. Saying bad, negative things about other people. You know, in Galatians chapter 5, verse 15, Paul warns about biting and devouring one another. Now, he's not talking about cannibalism there physically, 
But he is talking about it spiritually, isn't he? Biting and devouring. So he said, be careful about biting and devouring one another because what's going to happen? You're going to be consumed one of another. Somebody says something evil about you, what's the temptation? Say something a little worse about them. And then they'll say something a little worse about you. And you'll say something a little, you know, that's just a vicious cycle that never ends. Where does that kind of thing end? When we become children of God. It's where it better end. It may not, but it better end right there. That's exactly what he's saying here. Don't be talking in a slanderous way, some kind of defamatory statements in that regard. In uh, 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 12, I believe it is, and in verse um, 20, 2 Corinthians 12 verse 20, For I fear, lest when I come I shall not find you such as I would, and that I shall be found unto you, such as ye would not, lest there be debates, envies, wraths, strifes, backbitings, whisperings, swellings, tumults. So there's the idea of envy, wrath, strife, whispering, backbiting. That's to be put away from us. That's not a part of the faithful child of God. How easy is it to be caught up in that kind of thing? Somebody calls you, begins to run somebody down. What are you out to do? I didn't say what you should do. I said, what are you out to do? Listen. Concur. Maybe even throw in a thing or two about that person you know. What should you do? What should you do? Tell them to go to that person. Tell them to go to that person. Offer to go with them. Somebody calls you and begins to run somebody down. So, well, you know, it's obvious you have a problem with that individual. I'd like to come by and pick you up and let's go talk to him and see if we can get this worked out. How long would it be before they'd call you again? Long time, long time. You know, in order for people to be gossipers, what do they need? They need ears. They need ears. So while we may not be guilty of gossiping ourselves, can we be guilty of promoting it? We sure can. So we need to think about that. We're, we're growing and developing as children of God. That kind of thing needs to be put away from us, and that's what he's saying in this regard. The, the real idea here is, uh, is kicking around other people's reputation like you would a football. No regard, just kick them around. You don't have any love for them, you don't have any concern for them. After all, if we can run somebody else down, what does that do for us? Makes us look a little better, doesn't it? Run somebody else down, makes you look a little better. Supposedly, but it really doesn't. You see, these things belong to that, that old man. We mentioned a moment ago, Colossians chapter 3, and actually verse 5 begins to list things that are to be mortified or put to death. It goes all the way down through verse 9. Many of the same things that, that Peter talks about right here. Why do you think it's so important that, that Paul would mention these things and Peter would mention these things and, and John would mention these things? Why is that so important that, that all of these writers mention these things? Could it be because they're very common occurrences? Common occurrences. But the child of God's going to get rid of that. And so, so Peter says to these people, now that you realize the position you occupy, you're children of God. You're among the elect. You've been born again. There's just some things about life that will not be a part of your life anymore. Put them away once and for all. 
Get rid of them. As newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the Word, that ye may grow thereby. So, so these hindrances to growth in verse 1. Then when you come down to verse 2, he gives us what it's going to take to grow in that regard. So now instead of filling your life with malice and guile and hypocrisy and envy and evil speaking, you're going to fill your life with what? A study of the Word of God. A study of the Word of God. That's how important the Word is to us. As children of God, we're going to, we're going to spend time with it. Get rid of those old things. So he says, as newborn babes desire, as. That word as introduces a comparison. Do we understand the comparison here? New baby is born into this world. What do we do? We feed it. When that baby gets hungry, what does he do? He lets you know he has a desire for more milk. And if you don't pay attention, he'll express that desire to a greater degree. That's the idea that, that Peter's expressing right. Just like that newborn desires that feeding. What does the child of God, what does the new babe in Christ desire? To be fed with what? The milk of the Word. And what's going to be the benefit? It's going to grow. It's going to develop. It's going to mature. As is the natural reaction in the physical process of things. So there's a, there's a longing for that milk of the Word. Remember the statement, the beatitude that Jesus gives in Matthew chapter 5 and verse 6. Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. Now who's going to be filled? There, there's the blessing. But who's going to receive the blessing? Those who want it. Those who desire it. Those who literally, those words hunger and thirst suggest starving to death. Just gazing over the audience, I don't really see anybody that looks like they're starving to death this morning. Most of us probably have never been there. I've never been. I've been, I've been, felt like I was going to starve to death a few times, but I wasn't close. But the idea in, in Matthew chapter 5 is starving to death. Blessed are those who are starving for righteousness. Now, where is righteousness found? In the Word, Romans 1, 17, for therein, in the Gospel, is the righteousness of God revealed. So there's our desire. It is a very intense desire to feed upon the Word of God. Does that describe my life? Does that describe your life? If it doesn't, then we may not be growing like we should. Well, we may not be. We are not. You can't grow without proper nourishment. But there's the child of God. There's this new person in Christ. There's this person who has that relationship with God. To develop that relationship, you've got to, you've got to really have that desire to feed upon the Word of God. So the degree of that desire is of such nature that it's going to produce that growth and development that the child of God needs. So you'll notice desire the sincere milk of the word that, that. That word introduces the purpose of our desire for the milk of the word. 
Here's what we're wanting from it. Here's what we're working for. That growth and development. That's what we're interested in. That ye may grow thereby. Literally, the word thereby in the King James is therein. So from what source do we get our growth? In the Word of God. In the Word of God. So we grow therein. In the Word of God. So the definite thing that is desired is the sincere milk of the Word. Does every child of God desire the sincere milk of the Word? Obviously not. There were some in the early church. Hebrews writer describes them in Hebrews chapter 5, verses 12 to 14. When he says, for when for the time you ought to be teachers. You've been in the church long enough that you ought to be teaching other people. You have need that one teach you again. Which be the first principles of the oracles of God. And are become such as have need of milk, not of strong meat. Who are those that feed upon the meat of the word? Don't lose that comparison. What's he comparing us to? Newborn babes. Newborn babe has the desire for the milk. How long does that last? A few months? Then what do you do? Put them on something with a little more substance to it. Next thing you know, every time you turn around, they want to go to McDonald's. They don't want milk anymore. They want to go to McDonald's. Want something, want the meat of the Word now. So that's the way it is to work with us as children of God. We, we start out as babes. We grow and develop and mature. As a matter of fact, the Hebrews writer said that those who feed upon the milk are those who by reason of use have exercised themselves to discern good and evil. And so uh, that desire... Leads to growth and development. Gets us into the meat of the Word. That growth process lasts how long? As long as we last. There's always room for growth, isn't there? We never reach... You think about the statement the Apostle Paul made about himself. When he says, I've not yet attained. I haven't reached my goal yet. I'm still growing. I'm still reaching. I'm still pressing on. To the mark. So if we're content, complacent, where we are, what's wrong? Well, literally, we are in, we're dying spiritually. We're dying. If we're not continuing to feed upon the Word, we're dying. You cut off somebody's food supply, what's going to happen? They're going to start the process of dying. And it won't take long. That's why it's discouraging to elders when they provide opportunities like this morning for Bible study. They provide the food. Most of the sheep are here, but what about the rest? They don't desire to feed upon the Word of God. It's not going to produce growth and development. It's going to produce death spiritually. They don't change that. And so whenever we have provision, when, whenever the shepherds provide the food for the sheep, what ought we to do? I grew up on a farm feeding cattle. And in the wintertime, those cattle would hunt and search and rake and scrape for something to graze on. But late in the afternoon, when they heard the tractor crank up, what do you think they did? Wherever they were, they started coming at breakneck speed to the area where they were fed every day. 
because the tractor cranked up. They knew we were coming with a load of hay to feed them, and they wanted to be there to eat of it, ran to it. Is that the way we are about feeding upon the Word of God? Ever the, the, the shepherds provide food for us? Are we excited about getting to go and eat again? Feed upon the Word of God? Yeah, I guess we're going to have to go. It's a gospel meeting. And if we don't go, you know, some of the elders are going to be calling us. No, that's not what it's all about. It's that eagerness to go and feed upon that Word. And that, that's what Peter's in essence saying to these people here in verses 1 and 2 as a result of, of the position they occupy in chapter 1. Here's the, here's the people you are now. You are people who are starving to death for the Word of God so you can grow and develop. So proper growth and development requires proper food and exercise. It does physically. It does spiritually. The sincere desire, the sincere milk of the Word. Literally, the word sincere there means without wax. It's an art sculptor word that means without wax. Pure. Sincere milk of the word. That's, that's what we're desiring. The unadulterated word or the gospel as we sometimes refer to it. So as newborn babes, that's where he wants these people to go. But if we are beyond that, does that mean this passage has absolutely no meaning for us? No, because we still have room to grow. We still need to eat. As long as we are spiritually alive, we still need to eat. Lest we die spiritually. That's a never-ending process. All right, Lord willing, we'll pick up right there uh, next Sunday morning. You got it.